In chapter 39, the book of Ezekiel, please. The Ukraine War. Let's go ahead and re remind ourselves. Are you ready, Chris? They did tell you which one to load, right? It was the Raider highlights from the year two. No, there it is. There's our world map, everybody. Go ahead. There is, go ahead, there's Ukraine on the north of the Black Sea. Uh, go ahead again. There's Russia. The Bible is going to talk about those in Ezekiel 38. It's going to call Russia Gog, who is the demon in charge of the dude who's running Meshach and Tubal. That's Russia. Hit their go button again. But it's really all about this. It's all about Israel. Right there. There's where Israel is. Um, you know, we're going to be in chapter 39, but let's review real quickly. Do you mind? Go back to chapter 38. Let's look at verse 1. Chapter 38, Ezekiel, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, oh, by the way, with your eyes, look back up there, chapter 37. Um, we sang it this morning. Um, look at chapter 37, verse 1. He brought me down in the spirit. Look at this. And there was a valley full of what kind of bones, you guys? Dry bones. How dry? Well, the sun was bleached them. And then the Lord asks Ezekiel uh, an anatomical question. Can dry old bones ever be a living, breathing body again? Good answer by Ezekiel. Uh, you know, Lord. Good answer. Good answer. Speak to the bones. And if you remember, that's where that old hymnal, dim bones, dim bones, dim dry old bones. That's where it comes from. And then sinew and flesh came upon him, and they stood up, but there was no breath in them. Remember that. That's a key ingredient. Is there any breath in these? Nope. Just got a bunch of inanimate bodies standing there. Well, it's because they need the spirit. Prophesied to the spirit, and the spirit came in, and then they all became a living soul and an exceedingly great army. That's chapter 37. Chapter 38 now, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog. We looked at this last week. This is the demon Hancho in charge of raising up an end times empire. In land of Magog, that's Russia. The chief prince is this Gog fella, a fallen angel. The chief prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, that's Russia. We ran that down. Skip down to verse 5. He's going to put together, is Gog and Magog, he's going to put together a coalition. And here's what's going to happen. Verse 5. Persia, there's Iran. Ethiopia, Libya. Um, Ethiopia, by the way, there's still a residue of an Ethiopia today, but it's nothing like what it was during this writing. Remember, Ethiopia was so substantial that there was a significant queen that came from there. She was the queen of... Sheba, who came to talk to Solomon. It was huge. In fact, go ahead with our next slide here. Here are the modern designations. Persia is Iran. Fascinating. A hundred years ago, if somebody were to say to you, better watch out for Russia, you know what you might have said? Russia. They are nothing. You better watch out for Iran. What? Now is Russia a main player in geopolitics? And is Iran as well? Yes. Did you know that the Bible says that in the very last days, Iran and Russia are going to be buddies? Let me ask you, are they today? Yes. Ethiopia, that's really North Africa, Islamic North Africa. Libya, pardon me, Ethiopia is mid to east and the east coast of Africa, that's Somalia, Yemen, and all that place. Now Libya, that's North Africa. And all of them, and all of them with shield and helmet. And then Gomer. And that's what we looked at last week. Gomer is where Ukraine is. But it's, it's in that area, Ukraine, and the surrounding regions. The Bible prophesies that this region, including the Ukraine, will one day be under Russian control. Is this speaking of the current attack of Russia on the Ukraine? Answer, I don't know. I don't know. I'm praying that they're able to stand firm and to throw off this awful incursion into their country. And may we all pray as such. But I want to quickly hasten, what if the rapture happens anytime soon? Then you see the rapture can change anything. But the Bible says, don't worry about it, or I should say, make no mistake, at one time, there's going to be a battle here in this region. And it's all going to be after Israel. They're going to go after spoil. And it's naming this coalition, Iran, uh, if you will, 
East and Northeast Africa. Libya, which is really today Libya, Morocco, and all those regions there are with them. And then the Ukraine and all of its troops and the house of Tagarma, that's Turkey, from, a far, from the far north. Verse seven, prepare yourself and be ready. You and all your companies are gathered about you. You are the honcho, you're the guard. Quickly, verse 13, Sheba and Dedan, these are the people that are on the sidelines going, no, no, uh neener, neener, you shouldn't be doing that. You know who Sheba is? And Dedan, that's Saudi Arabia. And the merchants of Tarshish, Tarshish is Great Britain, the British Isles, the UK. Fascinating. And all her what? Young lions. Can you think of an empire of sorts, a nation that came out of the Great Britain era, an area? I think this might be a reference to us. Then it's going to go on here. Now we're going to go to chapter 39. Is this battle currently for Ukraine that which will bring a big part of Gomer back into Gog's or Russia's influence? We'll see. We don't know. Also, if you would, skip down with your eyes, look down to verse 11. Now, what is going to prompt the battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is that God puts a hook in Gog, Magog's jaw. He gives him a tantalizing carrot that Russia just cannot not take advantage of. Now, notice the notion, verse 11. Well, what are they going to do? Verse 11 of chapter 38. You will say, I'm going to go up against the land, Israel, of unwalled villages. Is that what your Bible says? And, and I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. And why? Verse 12, to take plunder. I personally believe that the battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is not quite ready yet. Let me show you why. Let's go ahead to our next slide. Unwalled villages, huh? Go ahead. Here's a quick little map of what's called the Israel, Israeli security fence. Ariel Sharon, starting in about the year 2000 and later, he knew that it was, a great, it was a great challenge to the peaceful society that the PLO or other Hezbollah, Hamas, all of the, the great um, terrorist organizations that are calling for the destruction of Israel, they would sidle up to a group of people waiting for a bus into a schoolyard with their explosive vests to discharge. So Ariel Sharon began something called the Israeli security fence, and there you see a quick little representation. The thick red lines, those are completed, and uh, the thin red line, that's proposed. You want to get a look at it, let's go ahead. Here's what it looks like in the urban areas, a great big 30-foot high walls. If you have really good eyes, look down to the bottom of the frame, just right of center, and you can see a dude walking there. Those are big walls. Go ahead. Here's another one. Uh, in some urban area, there is part of the security fence. There are some humans in the foreground to give you a sense of scale. In the wide open rural areas, it looks like this. Go ahead. And here is parts of the security fence. They're patrolled 24-7, uh, landmines, and sometimes those fences are, are doubled up. Go to our next slide. Here's Benjamin Netanyahu not long ago visiting one of the gates of the security fence. Go ahead. And here's another picture of an IDF soldier um, at one of the gates. Let me ask you, is Ezekiel 38 talking about unwalled, dwelling safely? Remember last week I told you that in the year 2005, that, Ru that Israelis in the northern part of Israel spent a month in a bomb shelter. Do you remember me mentioning more than 60% of the Israeli population own a gas mask? Is Ezekiel 38 talking about them dwelling safely? Since 2005, from the north, the Hezbollah, from the Gaza Strip in the south, Hamas, more than 10,000 rockets and missiles have been lobbed into Israel. Does Ezekiel 38, unwalled villages, dwelling safely, without gates and bars, does that seem uh, currently an apt description? 
I don't think so. Now, not everybody agrees with me, but I don't think so. Um, also, I want to let you guys know that the Battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is not the Battle of Armageddon. In fact, let's go over it real fast, Mike. You ready? Real quickly, we went over it last week, but uh, the Armageddon campaign, number one, go ahead with our next slide. Number one, the Armageddon campaign, Israel is invaded from the whole earth. Ezekiel 38 and 39, Israel is invaded from the north. Uh, you saw the circle of, of all those nations coming in, but don't forget, Ezekiel 38 says Russia is the honcho. They're going to follow in Russia, and they're going to come in from the north. Number two, the king of the north in Daniel chapter 11 is forced into the Armageddon scenario, but in this scenario, it's Magog in the north. They start the conflict, so that's not the same thing. Number three, in the Armageddon campaign, the Antichrist is prominent. Here, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, notice no mention of Antichrist. Number four, the Armageddon battle, all nations involved in this campaign, if we take a careful assessment, Egypt is not involved, so they're different. Number five, the purpose of the Armageddon campaign is to destroy all the Jews. What is the motivation here in Ezekiel 38 and 39 for spoil? Number six, Israel is in immediate flight to Petra, says Jesus in Matthew 24. Here, as we'll see today, chapter 39, there's going to be a seven-year cleanup. Uh, so now let's get started. When will this battle take place? Chapter 39, I believe, gives us some startling details. Verse 1. And you, son of man, this is Ezekiel, prophesy against Gog, that's the demon in charge of this whole mess. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince, if you will, demonic honcho, of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. We ran those down last week. That's Russia. I will turn you around and lead you on. You might want to uh, highlight lead you on real quickly. If you have a King James Version, it doesn't say lead you on. It says leave but a sixth part. This is important. The Hebrew here, um, in English, lead you on, New King James and many other. And then in King James, leave but a sixth. There's just three letters here. They are the Hebrew letters, she, she, aleph. I hope I'm pronouncing those correctly. The Hebrew letter she is most verses translated six. In fact, it's the word for the cardinal number six or sixth. In the Bible, there is no example of she, she, aleph, meaning to lead. Nowhere, nowhere. I don't know why the newer translators say lead you on. I think King James had it more accurately. And I will turn you, Gog, around, and when you show up, there's only going to be one-sixth of you left. That's what it really means. So you could say it another way. Of all these forces attacking Israel, five-sixths of them are wiped out. How? We're going to see supernaturally. Check it out. Bringing you up from the far north and bringing you against the mountains of Israel. Verse 3. Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Verse 5, and you shall fall in the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord. Five-sixths of this invading army is going to be suddenly killed. And did you know that the Bible tells us how that's going to happen? I'll show you in just a sec. Verse 6, and I will send fire. Is that a natural calamity or is it a military devastation? I'm going to send fire on Magog, Russia, and on those who live securely in the coastlands. This is where we should get a little nervous if you're not a born-again believer. Who are the coastlands? Well, those are people, if you're standing on the shores of the Mediterranean in Israel and you're looking west, it's all the people on the other side of that big blue I believe this does refer to Europe. I believe it does refer to Africa. Can you think of another sort of coastland area across the pond? 
I think America. Let's continue. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Who is the they? All the people that saw this tremendous response of the Lord here in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Verse 7. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people. Now, I'm going to take you on a little journey. If you don't have a Bible, I hope you can look on to someone next to you. Um, my people, would you circle that, please? My people, Israel. Did you know that there is this period of time when God says to Israel, you are not my people? What? I thought God would never write Israel a certificate of divorce. He doesn't. Paul is going to tell us a little more of the story. A blindness in part. Hold your finger here. Let's go to the Old Testament book of Hosea. Hosea, can you see? I'm very sorry for that. Chapter 1, Hosea. It's just a little ways to your right. Here is Hosea. He's writing about 150 years, thereabouts, before the prophet of Ezekiel. What's happening in Israel during Hosea's time? The northern ten tribes region are being awful. Just awful. One terrible usurper, rebellion, murders the previous Israel king, northern ten tribes region, uh, head honcho, and then they set up their rebellious empire, and then the next guy. Nineteen kings come and go, and all of the northern parts, the northern ten tribes of Israel, finally God says, you're not listening. I send you prophets, and one of them is Hosea. You know the story. Hosea, you're going to fall in love. Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah, well, hold on a second, Hosea. Who you're going to fall in love with is going to be a harlot. And she's never, ever going to be faithful to you. She's going to go off and do what she does. And all of Israel is going to tee-hee, giggle behind your back. Huh, there's, a, there's Gomer, interesting enough. There's her name. Um, there she is, you know, and, she's, and you, you, she's your wife, but we know what she's doing on the weekends. And instead of snickering at foolish Hosea for not writing her a certificate of divorce, he is a model of Israel, northern ten tribes, to God himself. I love you like a wife, and I'm never going to divorce you, although you go out on me and go out on me. Check out, if you're in chapter 1, look at verse number 8. Hosea chapter 1, verse 8. Now when she, Gomer, had weaned lo Ramah, she conceived and bore a son. This is her second son. And God said, call his name lo Ami." Right in your margin here, you know what this means? Not my people. That's what this name means. You call the name of this child a model of me faithful to my wife, even though Israel is always going out on me with other gods. You call the offspring of this current state of the union lo a me, not my people. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Oh my. Well, how long is that going to take? Write your margin here until, and write this, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, and then verse 21 and 22. How long are you going to be, my people? In Hosea, here's another little answer. Move over now to chapter 5 of Hosea. Look down at verse number 15. There's a number of things that God prophesies that he will do. And those all happen and they come to pass. Now you arrive at chapter 5 of Hosea. Now you're about, about verse 15. But I'm going to come back. I'm going to restore Israel. Look at verse 15. And then I, who is speaking here, Jehovah God, I will return again to my place until they, Israel, acknowledge their offense. Now notice there's only one singular offense that's in the heart of the Father. They'd committed a number of terrible sins, to be sure. But there's something in the heart of the Father, specifically, that he's thinking of. And by the way, I'm going to return again. Does your Bible say again? Where does God typically live, if you will? In heaven. Why is he going back to heaven? It means he left heaven. Question, 
When did God the Father leave heaven? I got an answer for you. When he zipped up a human suit and came to the planet. Then they, Israel, will seek my face and in their affliction. Another way to render that is tribulation. And in their affliction, their tribulation, they will earnestly seek me. Well, how will they do that? And right in your margin here, at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. We know that to be true. Let's take a quick review. We know that there's a seven-year period that Daniel told us all about in Daniel chapter 9. The last of a 70-week prophecy is yet to come. It's the 70th week of Daniel. It's the book of Revelation. That 70th week, a seven-year period, is divided into two halves. In the first half, a certain number of things are going to happen. In the first half, Israel will embrace the Antichrist as her Messiah. Seriously? By the way, um, all of that happened in model form. Jesus, they throw him in front of Pontius Pilate. Kill him, he's blaspheming. What's his blasphemy? He's saying that he's God. Pilate says, are you sure you want to do this? Oh yeah, we don't have the authority to kill him because that resides only with the Romans, capital punishment. You kill him. Then he happens upon something. Wait a minute, there's a loophole. I get to release to you somebody else. Do you want me to release this, this Jesus as a, as a part of a loophole that maybe I can get out of this responsibility? Do you remember what the crowd of Israel, Jerusalem said? No, we don't want him. Give us, do you remember his name? Bar Abbas, Bar Abbas, Bar, son of. Abba means what? Father, in model form, we don't want this son of the Father, Jesus, who is walking on water and raising the dead and healing the sick and power over demons. No, no, no. Give us another son of the Father. That is a model of when Israel will cry for the Antichrist as their Messiah. It's coming. How's he going to do that? We don't know exactly how it's going to shake down, but the book of Daniel tells us that the Antichrist is going to show up on the world stage amid a great upheaval, and the Antichrist is going to coalesce enough power, uh, monetary, military, and what have you, have enough charisma that he is going to stop some very plaguing, some real challenging chapter in the, in the human story, and earth is going to be so rattled by it that they're going to say, just save us. And one of the things he's going to do is he's going to say to the Jews, I will make sure that no other nation will ever bother you again. And here's a signatory of this promise. I'm going to see that you get your temple built. Israel was kicked out of... His, Israel was kicked out of her land 70 AD by the Romans, scattered all over the planet until 1948. United Nation decree, you can have your land back except for one little portion. You remember what that portion was? Can't have Jerusalem. We're going to give that to the Jordanians. Then in 1967, Israel is attacked by all the surrounding areas, nations. She prevails in a six-day war. That's the point when she wins the Golan Heights. That's the point when she wins the West Bank. And that's the point when she wins Jerusalem back. Now that Jerusalem belongs to Israel. But do they build, have they built a temple currently in Jerusalem? No. Why? Because you'd have 900 million Islamics saying, oh, we're not going to let that happen. So the political climate is not quite ready for Israel to rebuild her temple. But it's coming. And you know who's going to be the key individual that makes it happen? The Antichrist. And they're so overwhelmed by it that evidently Antichrist says, I'm going to build you this temple and I'm going to see to it that none of these surrounding nations will ever bother you again. Take down your walls. Take down your gates. If they're going to get to you, Israel, they've got to come through me. 
It's an overwhelming promise, and Israel falls for it. Guess how long the Antichrist makes this covenant for? For seven years. But something happens in the midst, in the middle. A number of events, but it culminates with the Antichrist saying, nobody can worship <clears throat> any other god except me. And he goes to the Jewish temple that he had built, and he puts a statue of himself in the Holy of Holies. And then says, if anybody worships anybody else, any other God but me, off with your head. It's at the midpoint that Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's what the statue thing is. If you're in Jerusalem, get right to the rock city of Petra. And the blindness in part comes off of Israel. Ding! That guy is not our Messiah. And then the Bible says that all of Israel is going to get poured out upon them the Spirit of God. This is what Hosea chapter 5, or now chapter 6, Hosea. And they'll say, Israel will say, Come, let us return to the Lord. Notice capital L O R N D. That's Jehovah. He has torn us, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After, what does it say? Two days, he, Jehovah, will revive us. Right in your margin here, 2 Peter 3, verse 8. Peter said, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. This could potentially be rendered for two millennia, We've had it rough. But on that third millennia, he will rise us up and we will live in his sight. There's a number of other verses and they're gonna cry, says the book of Micah chapter two, verse 12, and they're gonna shout with a great noise, Jesus, come! And in heaven, Jesus hears Israel Cry out for him, the rightful Messiah. And what do you suppose he does about that? He comes. It's one of the reasons why the Antichrist, pardon me, why almost every evil sort of dis, dispos, despot comes to the fore. And if he gets enough power that he can kill whoever he wants to, have you noticed they all go after what ethnic group of people? The Jews. Because the Jews have one of many important tasks left and if he can wipe out all the Jews then there will be no one saying come Lord Jesus and now let's go to Jeremiah chapter chapter 30 I'm going to show you this Jeremiah chapter 30 you are not my people lo ami well how long is that going to last now we're in Jeremiah chapter 30 God has told them all about it Jeremiah chapter 30 we'll start with verse 7 alas for that day is great what day? And there is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. You should probably highlight that. That is the seven-year tribulation, talked about in a very succinct manner. Jacob's trouble. And uh, there are those that believe that the church will be in the great tribulation. No, it's not the church's trouble. It's whose trouble? Jacob's trouble. God has returned his prophetic attention to Israel. Now with your eyes, if you would, skip down to verse number 18. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring back the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places. The city, upon, the city shall be built upon its own mound, which has happened. In the interest of time, verse 20, please. Their children, Jerusalem's children, also shall be as before, and their congregation shall be established before me. You couldn't say this until after 1948. Can you say it now? Yes. And I will punish all who oppress them. Verse 21. And their nobles shall be from among them. And their governor shall come in their midst. Notice carefully, it says governor. Is there going to be a last and final king of Israel? Yes. Any clues as to who that might be? It's going to be Jesus. Jesus is the rightful heir of the throne of David. Notice that Jeremiah doesn't say king, he says governor. When Israel comes back to the land in 1948, do they have a king or do they have a prime minister? 
Currently, it's Naftali Bennett. It was Benjamin Netanyahu for a long time. And this is exactly what's happening. They have a governor from their midst. And I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. And it goes on. Look at verse 22. And you shall be, what? My people. Right here, of course, Ezekiel 30, 39. Ezekiel chapter 39. You are not my people, starting with the northern ten tribes region, judgment through the Assyrians. 150 years later, the lower two tribes, uh, they follow their northern brothers and they go into terrible, terrible idolatry. God brings the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem. They export Ezekiel. And from Babylon, Ezekiel in chapter 10, he sees the glory of the Lord leave the temple, Solomon's temple that arrived at that beautiful day of dedication. He saw the glory of the Lord come out of the temple, traverse the valley of Kidron, and from the Mount of Olives, rise up and float away. The glory of the Lord left. When, and they are not my people, when did the glory of the Lord return to the Mount of Olives? Palm Sunday. There's Jesus on the donkey. Here I am, Zechariah 9.9 said I'd be sitting on a donkey. He's there 173,880 days to the day that Daniel said he would be there. Oh, he's standing there on Palm Sunday saying, what about me? Do you remember what happens? At first, it goes pretty well. Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he, Messiah, who comes in the name of the Lord, Jehovah. And Jesus stops the whole parade and he begins to weep. Why? Oh, Jerusalem, if you would have only known what day this was. Wasn't anyone near Ezekiel chapter 10? The glory of the Lord departed from the Mount of Olives. It had returned if they would have embraced Jesus as Messiah. But what happens? He goes through the Kidron Valley and instead of kicking out Romans and beginning the millennial reign of Messiah, he turns over the table and tables. And after that, the nation goes, oh, he's not our Messiah Give us Barabbas, another son of the father. Israel has not been my people from Hosea chapter 5 until the midpoint of the great tribulation. Now back to Ezekiel. Let's finish up in chapter 39. Ezekiel chapter 39, it's really important. Verse 7, one more time. And I will make my holy name known in the midst of... My people. Now you know the story. Right here, Jeremiah 30, verse 22. It's at the midpoint the abomination of desolation happens. It's at the midpoint. They look at the Antichrist and go, dude, you're so not our Messiah. It's at the midpoint that the blindness in part comes off. Remember on Palm Sunday, Jesus said, now these things are hidden from you. It's at the midpoint that Hosea chapter 5 kicks in. Ding, you are our Messiah. And they cry out for salvation and God hears. Verse 7, one last time. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people. Now we know when that happens. And I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Why? Because they're saved, that's why. Then the nations, those are the non-Jewish nations, shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Surely it is coming and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. Um, and then there's other locations. One of them is the book of Psalms, by the way. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. How many of you sung that song at the, around the campfire? Did you know that it was not just any day? You know what this day is talking about? The day that Israel goes, ding, Jesus is Messiah. 
more about this specific battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's not the battle of Armageddon, verse 9. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons. Remember, God has interacted hugely and all of the invading Gog and Magog and their coalition, five-sixths of them are laying dead among the mountains of Israel. They're going to go and find those dead guys' weapons. Both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the javelins and the spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. It's this mention that Pastor Chuck for years and Missler for a number of years believed that it must happen, the battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39 must happen at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. It very well could be, but I don't think so. Wait a minute, Pastor Steve. If you're saying they're going to burn weapons for seven years, if they receive Jesus and the eyes are opened at the midpoint, if they're my people at the midpoint, I get the first three and a half years, they're going to burn those for fuels because planet Earth is really getting wiped out. Doesn't that leave three and a half years hanging out in the millennium, so to speak? Yes, it does. And I don't know that I have a great answer, but the thought occurs to me. How much damage and devastation has taken place in the course of the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls? Really rough stuff. Is there the possibility that the transition from broken, irradiated planet Earth to pristine millennial rain condition, is this a sort of a signet that there will be a transitionary period of sorts? The real answer is, I don't know, but I wonder. Verse 10, they will not, they will not take wood from the field nor cut down any from the forest because they will make fires with the weapons and they, Israel, will plunder those who plundered them. And pillage those who pillage them, says the Lord. Were, were some of these things nukes? I find this fascinating. Check out the condition of some of those who perished in this five-sixth judgment of Magog. Verse 11. I will come to, it will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog, all those guys buried, a burial place. And where is you guys? There. And then what does your Bible say? In Israel, this is important, highlight that, inside Israel's border. And the valley of those who pass by, really on its east side, or the east side of the sea, this is speaking of the Dead Sea. People that are on the east of the Dead Sea, currently, what nation is east of the Dead Sea today? This, the country of Jordan. Keep reading. Um, watch this. Um, currently, the only nation on the Dead Sea's east is Jordan. There's no way a foreign country is going to allow radioactive bodies to be buried inside their borders. This is what it's going to say. Bury them downwind and bury them here in this valley. And we're going to show you that in just a minute. I believe that the nations of Ezekiel 38 and 39, which are, um, if you would go, go back up, Notice all those nations. Those are kind of far around a larger circle. Would you agree with me that possibly that currently there are more troublesome nations closer to Israel's border? Now let's go through them real quickly. Go ahead. There we go. Currently, it's not Russia that's Israel's problem. Did you hear that um, Naftali Bennett, the current prime minister, actually met with Putin the last couple of days? Did you see that? For three hours. It is in Israel's current best intention to not cheese off Russia. Why? Because Russia holds a strong hand in Iran and in Syria. So Israel is trying to walk that tightrope. So Magog really isn't Israel's problem right now. Who is Israel's problem? It's Hezbollah in Lebanon. It's Iran and Russia using Syria as a proxy to bomb them. It is not Jordan just yet, but you know that the Hashemite kingdom is in a precarious position. Did you know that there are more PLO people in population in Jordan than there are native Jordanians? And in 2004, a plot was discovered to blow up the 
centralized Capitol buildings there in Amman, Jordan, so that the PLO could take control of the nation. The Bible says that it's in Jordan currently that these dead bodies are going to be buried. Now, Egypt is not really a problem to the south, but is Gaza. Yes, that's Hamas. And then right in their midst, you've got the Palestinians there in Hamas. These are the countries that are more closely a problem. I believe, and we're going to go over this next week, I believe that there's another battle in front of the battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's the battle of Psalm 83, and I'm going to show you why. Go ahead to our next section. I'm going to show you this next, next week. We'll go into it in great detail. But to sort of whet your appetite, do you know the Bible, number one, talks about a toppling of Jordan. It talks about that Amman, the capital city, is going to be a ruinous heap. Do you know that there is going to be a destruction of Damascus? Damascus is currently the, the capital of Syria and Bashir al-Assad. Do you know the Bible says they're going to go to bed worrying and by the morning time, Damascus will be a ruinous heap. And you know who the Bible says does that? Israel. There's a disaster in Elam. That's Iran. I'll tell you about that in the precarious place where the Iranians have built their nuclear reactor. After the last Arab-Israeli war, which I believe is talked about in Isaiah, pardon me, uh, Psalm 83, you're going to see the rise of Israel's exceedingly great army. That was the army I was showing you in Ezekiel 38. There's going to be an expansion of Israel's border. I'm going to show you Obadiah chapter 1. Israel is exceedingly wealthy and secure. I believe it's to stop this last Arab-Israeli war that the Antichrist shows up because nukes have flown. After all, Damascus is gone. Amman is gone. And likely what, was it, what it was in response to was Israel knew that a preemptive strike was needed and necessary. That would be impossible. Of course, it seems so today. But the rapture could change everything. It could. Peace is going to be enforced by the Antichrist, Daniel 9. And down come her walls and gates, potentially fulfilling Ezekiel 38. Why would Jordan allow Israel to bury radioactive bodies inside of its borders? I'm going to show you next week. Because at the time it happens, this area of Haman Gog will belong to Israel. And it, this burial field, will obstruct travelers. Unfortunate um, translation. The Hebrew word is ha-abarim. Ha-abarim. The valley of Abarim. The Abarim mountains are on the east side of the Dead Sea. Check out Numbers 33, verse 48. A.K.A. God called it Moab. So this burial field will likely be in the valley of the Abarim Mountains. And for reference, right in your margin here, Psalm 60, verse 8, Moab is my wash pot. You know what a wash pot is? It's a chamber pot. It's a porta potty. Continuing, continuing now in Ezekiel 39, because they, because there, they will bury Gog, five, six of those, and all of his multitude. Therefore, they will call it the Valley of Haman Gog. The Valley of Abarim is going to be changed to the Valley of the Hordes of Gog. More details about this battle. Verse 12. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them. Who? The five, six that fell. In order to cleanse the land, so many casualties. Verse 13, indeed all the people of the land will be burying and they will gain renown for it on the day that I am glorified. When is Jesus glorified? In the mouths and hearts of the people at the midpoint. When does the whole world glorify Jesus as Messiah? Revelation 19, when he comes back at the end of the tribulation. Verse 14, they will set apart men regularly employed. Read that, professionally trained. These are a hazmat group and situation. Are you sure? Watch this. They're going to be professionally trained 
with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. Cleanse it? Hold your finger here. Go to Zechariah 14, verse 12. I was going to read it for you, but I want you to see it. Zechariah, the last prophet right before Malachi. Zechariah 14 talks about this battle. Check this out. Chapter 14, look at verse 12. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Here, write Ezekiel 38 and 39. Look at the description. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Was there such a weapon available in Zechariah's day? Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. And it's going to go on. Uh, what? Were there any weaponry available in that day? Zechariah is telling us about a technology statement. Is this thermonuclear results? We'll see. Watch closely what else happens. Uh, continuing in verse number 14, you're gonna, we're going we're gonna to have to professionally train people to bear them, to bury them. At the end of seven months, they shall make a search. Did we get them all? Verse 15, the search party will pass through the land and anyone, when anyone sees a man's bone from this battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39, he shall set up a marker. Don't touch it. He'll set up a marker by it until the professional barriers come and have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. Currently, that's Jordan. At this time, I believe this belongs to Israel. I'm going to show you that next week. Verse 16. And the name of the valley will be called Haman or Hordes. Hamona. Thus they shall cleanse the land. Verse 17. Let's zoom quickly to the end. And as for you, son of man, Ezekiel, thus says the Lord God, speak to every sort of bird and every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come together, you birds and beasts. Gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal. These are the five-sixths of the, of the Magog invasion, which I am sacrificing for you, a great sacrificial meal in the mountains of Israel. You shall eat the flesh and drink the blood. By the way, don't eat those birds that eat that, okay? Because they'll be glowing in the dark as well. Verse 18. You shall eat the flesh and the mighty of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, rams and lambs and goats and bulls and all of them fatling of Bashan. That's um, the Golan Heights. Verse 19. You shall eat fat till you are full, you birds, and drink the blood till you are drunk at my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you. And you shall be filled at my table with horses and riders, the five, six guys that... that that um, were killed with, with mighty men and with the men of war, says the Lord God. This huge response, why does God do this? Is for God's people. Verse 21, we're almost done. Hang in there. Verse 21, and I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see this great judgment, me stepping in into the notice of all the peoples of the planets that I am on Israel's side. I believe at the midpoint of the Great Tribulation. I will set my glory among all the nations and all the nations are going to see my judgment, which I have executed. They're going to look at this thing and go, wow, look what God did to stop that. And my hand, which I have laid on them, Israel, so the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord, their God, from that day forward. And the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord. They are now my people again. Verse 23, the Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me, starting in Hosea chapter 1. Um, and then they're going to finally get it. Therefore, I hid my face from them. That's when, I was, that's when they were not my people. I gave them into the hands of their enemies, and they all fell to the sword. Who's that? That goes all the way back to the northern ten tribes' defeat 
by the Assyrians, and then the southern two tribes defeat by the Babylonians, and then the Greek occupiers, and then the Roman occupiers, and then while they were scattered all over the planet, I allowed Hitler and future to us as I will allow a certain license for the Antichrist as well. Why'd you do that, Lord? Ask Hosea, because they wouldn't get rid of their idols. I had to let them get squeezed. By the way, you could also write here, this fulfills Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15 and following. If Israel does obey my commandments, nobody's going to touch them. But if they don't, I'm going to see to it that the Babylonians are going to take them in exile first. Then the Romans are going to come and scatter them all over the nation. Later on in Deuteronomy 28, it's chilling. And at some points, they're going to fear for their lives. And at night, they're going to say, oh, that it were morning. And in the morning, oh, that it were nighttime. They will fear for their lives. And I believe that culminates in the first Holocaust. All of that because Israel as a nation rejected Jesus as Messiah. Verse 24. And according to their uncleanness, Israel's uncleanness, and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. That's when they were not my people. Verse 25. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob. Write in your margin, 1948. He did that. But remember chapter 37. At first, can these bones be made to live? I don't know, Lord. Watch, speak. The bones came together. The sinew and flesh. Look at them. A bunch of inanimate objects. No breath. That is prophesying that Israel will come back from 1948, from the dispersion. They're going to come back. There'll be a nation, but no spirit. That doesn't happen until the breath comes in. When is that? the midpoint of the great tribulation. Then Zechariah 12 says, ding, the Antichrist is not our Messiah. Jesus is. Hosea says that they cry out, oh, Lord Jesus. And pardon me, um, Zechariah chapter 12 says, and that's when they look upon me, Jehovah God, whom they pray pierced. Wait a minute. When was Jehovah God pierced? Old Testament book. When was Jehovah God pierced? When he zipped up a human suit and died on a cross. Zechariah says when that realization hits them from kings all the way down to the lay people, All of Israel is going to mourn like Israel has never mourned before. And one of the things they mourn for and cry for is, Dear Lord Jesus, Messiah, come. Verse 25, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Now I will bring back the captives of Jacob. Done. 1948. But no breath. Not yet. And have mercy on the house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. And after they have borne their shame, and after their unfaithfulness, in which they have been unfaithful to me, that started really in Hosea chapter 1, then they will dwell safely in their own land, and no one will make them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, I, and I am hallowed in them in the sight of all the nations. Verse 28, then they shall know that I am the Lord, their God, who sent them into all those captivity situations among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. Verse 29, and I will not hide my face from them anymore starting at the midpoint of the great tribulation. For I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel. When does that happen? At the midpoint of the great tribulation. 
fulfilling Ezekiel 37, 9, when the breath comes in from the midpoint and now saved Israel calls for Jesus to return. Hosanna chapter 5, Micah chapter 2, and that's when Jesus says, here I come. And he comes down, Revelation 19, and who is right behind them? We are. Amen? Let's all stand. Are you intellectually exhausted? I hope not. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, I wonder how long it's been for many of us to review the events of Ezekiel, really 36, 37, the dry bones, 38 and 39 this is no doubt the demonic force of Gog working on the region of Magog, Meshach and Tubal. Is Putin Magog? Answer, I don't know. Is him going into the Ukraine to take out the democratically elected government there so that he can install a puppet government much like he has in Belarus? Well, that's what he's trying to do. Is this the forerunner that will set up Ezekiel 38 and 39? I don't know. But I do know this for a solid fact, Lord. We're talking about Gog and Magog here. We're talking about Gomer and Persia and Tagarma and Ethiopia. You're basically shouting from the heavens, Please get back into your Bibles. I've got all of these things detailed. Instead of fretting at CNN, is it within us, Lord, to smile and look up? Because Jesus said, when you see these things, wars and rumors of wars, check. Putin warming up his nukes, check. America and NATO warming up their defense? Check. Wars, rumors of wars. Pestilence, have we had enough COVID up to here just yet? I believe soon on the horizon, along with the weird weather, seriously, tornadoes in March in Iowa last night? I believe it's not far-fetched that I think we're probably going to see some earthquakes, some whoppers. I don't know. Like Dan read for us today, Jesus says, when you see these things, don't freak out. Instead, look up. Your redemption is near. I am this close to grabbing my church out of the way before the first seal on the scroll of Book of Revelation is, is popped. Everybody sit down, please, eyes closed for a minute. When is that going to happen? I don't know. I'm going to show you next week that Amos is all over it. I'm going to show you that God gave us an entire dress rehearsal in the battle of Second Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat et al., that was a dress rehearsal for something that's going to happen in the near future. I personally believe it's either right before or right after the rapture. We'll talk about that next week. All that aside, harvest, are you born again? That's the key issue. These are wearisome things to notice and watch, but God is trying to get the whole world's attention. Are you ready? Are you ready? Have you cried out for Jesus Christ to forgive you of all of your sin? Have you placed your entire life in his hands? Are you finally at a place, not my will, Lord, but yours? Are you saved? Are you born again? That's what's most important. Holy Spirit, do what you do. Convict all of our hearts, Lord, of sin, what we shouldn't be doing, of righteousness, what we should be doing, 
and of a judgment to come. Lord, all these events are not to shake us apart. They are to draw us together. Excited that your near return is so close at hand. And we say, Lord, come, Lord Jesus, come. But until then, Lord, may it be about your business here on the earth. In Jesus' name, and now everybody said, amen. Amen, Lord, amen. If you've got some questions, we can talk more about it after, or if you'd like some prayer, please come up to the front. We'll see you on Tuesday night prayer, everybody.